Okay, well, thank you very much for inviting me to be here. Um, this is a great conference, and, and I'm, I'm really delighted uh, that our paper was selected. Um, I also just want to note, given that this is a community banking conference, that the president and COO of uh, my mortgage lender is here. Uh, so, you know, sort of small world. Um, and, I, and, and uh, you know, I, I think I'm a good credit risk, but nonetheless, I'll say, uh, it, was, it, was, it was very fortunate. So my wife and I used to live in the UK. I was at London Business School and she was at LSE. We moved to the US, we had foreign income. So Kish Bank, thank you, where's, where's Gregory, is he here? Gregory, thank you very much to you and your team for allowing my wife and I to become homeowners. Um, you know, so that said, of course, when we go to refinance, if you're not offering the best rate, you know. <laughs> Which is a nice segue into competition and how competition affects the market structure of banks and bank profitability and risk taking. So there's a huge literature on interstate banking deregulation. Thousands of papers have been written. Um, and there's some disagreement in this literature. I've, I've got some citations here on the slides. Um, but by and large, the, there's sort of a, a, a narrative or paradigm that's taken hold since the mid 1990s that still holds. And the, the basic paradigm is as follows. Before deregulation, banks were basically lazy, and they weren't very efficient. And so deregulation happens, and now all of a sudden banks have to become more efficient. And so because of that, what you see in the data is that deregulation happens, NIM goes up, profitability goes up, and risk taking goes down. We're gonna argue in our paper, and I'll explain exactly how we do this, that there's a, a, a couple of measurement issues with the way that the literature has currently uh, addressed deregulation, and uh, we're going to find very different results. The other thing that we're going to try to look at, which is less studied in the literature, is how did deregulation actually change bank business models? Clearly, banks of today are very different than the banks that existed in the 1980s, right? And so there's securitization, fintech, shadow banking, et cetera. All of these have had a big role in transforming the banking system. But in addition, you know, competition probably had an effect too. And so we're going to try to isolate, you know, did competition help to facilitate uh, what we call the demise of old school banking, the, the sort of decline in portfolio lending and core deposits as part of the banking franchise. Um, so we're going to try to say something about that. So what exactly do we do? Well, our insight is that you know, you can think about deregulation, so states individually deregulated, you can think about this as basically a network, right, with states as nodes. So when two states deregulate, this is essentially switching on a link between those states. Now, what's new about this? Well, the vast majority of the existing literature basically says a state deregulated as soon as the state passed some law related to deregulation. Okay, and, and we're gonna, that, I'm gonna argue that that approach misses a lot of subtleties and complexities in actual uh, deregulation uh, legislation that's important. And I'll explain in a minute exactly what we do, but once we sort of take this network approach to the data, we find essentially the opposite of this sort of dominant paradigm. We find that higher competition caused by deregulation causes NIM to go down, causes profitability to go down, and causes risk taking to go up, which by the way is sort of what we observe in almost every other market. Now, what's driving this? Well, Keeley was the first to propose the narrative that, that we find evidence supporting um, in, back in 1990, uh, and Padma mentioned this paper as well. So basically, Keeley's logic is as follows. Before deregulation, banks are protected. There's entry restrictions. So if I'm a bank, I can essentially, you know, uh, offer depositors a really low rate, and they're going to be able, they're, gonna, they're not going to have any alternative, so they'll take it. In a sense, banks have market power or charter value. Now, if I relax entry restrictions, this is essentially eliminating charter value. And so what, what you should see is an increase in risk taking. Why? Well, if I have charter value, right, I don't want to take some crazy risk that causes my bank to fail, because if I fail, I lose the ability to extract these rents, these sort of excess profits from my borrowers or my customers. And so according to Keeley's paper, 
you know, these entry restrictions sort of naturally limit risk taking. And so once we remove them, we should see an increase in risk taking. And this is exactly what we're going to find. Okay. The data here is very standard, so I'm, I'm just going to skip this. Here's what we do. So there's sort of two things that are missing from the existing literature that I think our approach uh, allows us to, to sort of correct. So basically, when you think about deregulation, deregulation happened in sort of two types. First, there were these reciprocal arrangements between states. So Colorado banks could enter Nebraska, but only if Nebraska also allowed, you know, uh, or, or only if Nebraska banks could also enter Colorado, right? And the thing about these bilateral arrangements is that nothing actually happens until both states sign legislation, right? But the literature has just used the first state that a state uh, signed anything and said, well, the state's deregulated. And we're going to show that actually causes a significant difference in, in sort of when you assign the timing of these deregulation events. The other thing is that some states sort of unilaterally deregulate. They say, well, we're going to open up our markets to everyone. And so in a sense, this is going to create a one-way street. Now other banks from other states can enter that, bank's home, or that state's home market, but banks from that state can't necessarily go outside. Okay, and we're going to argue that these one-way streets are, are really useful because they allow us to try to isolate the actual effects of competition on outcomes. Okay, so what does this buy us solving these sort of two problems? Well, in addition to correcting the timing of when these events actually happened, this also allows us to disentangle the competing effects that happen when two states sort of bilaterally deregulate, which are increased competition in my local market, but increased investment opportunities for my local banks. So if you think about a traditional bilateral uh, arrangement, right, Colorado banks can now enter Nebraska. That's great, that's increased investment opportunities. But Nebraska banks can also enter Colorado. That's increased competition. The existing literature is essentially capturing both of these effects together. And so because of these one-way streets, we're going to be able to try to disentangle um, these two effects. So what do we exactly do? Well, we're, we're going to code a variable called states in. This is just a count at any given point in time for a given state. This is a count of how many other states' banks can access that state's market. Okay? So if you're Colorado, how many other states have access to Colorado's market? We're going to code another variable called states out. This is just how many states can Colorado banks access. So states in is a measure of competition. It's how many other states can access my local markets. States out is a measure of investment opportunities. You know, how many states can my banks access? And as our main measure of competition, we're going to take the difference between these two variables, which we call net states in. Right? And I'll show you an example in just a second, but the, the, the difference in these two variables is exactly going to pick up these one-way streets. Okay? So here's an example. Colorado, Nebraska, and Massachusetts. In 1981, nothing's happened. Right? No, no, nothing, nobody, none of these states have done anything. So states in is zero, states out is zero. And this is in the context of Colorado. 1998, Colorado signs a regional reciprocal agreement with Nebraska. The literature says 1998, uh, 1988 is when Colorado deregulated. The thing is, though, Nebraska didn't also sign a reciprocal arrangement. And so actually nothing happened. Colorado banks couldn't go to Nebraska. Nebraska banks couldn't go to Colorado. So our states in and states out measures are still zero. Fast forward to 1991, Nebraska finally reciprocates. So now Nebraska banks enter Colorado, Colorado banks enter Nebraska. States in goes up by one because Nebraska banks enter Colorado. States out goes up by one because Colorado banks enter Nebraska. Okay, so net states in, the net sort of competition shock here is still effectively zero. Later in 1991, Colorado signs a national non-reciprocal agreement, which basically allows banks in any other state to enter Colorado without requiring reciprocal privileges for their banks. So now banks in Massachusetts can enter Colorado, even though banks in Colorado can't enter Massachusetts. So now what do you see? Well, now states in goes up because now Massachusetts banks can enter Colorado. States out doesn't change because Colorado banks can't enter Massachusetts. Okay, and so this is going to create uh, a measure that's, that we think is a much purer competition shock or competition measure than what's existed in the literature. 
Okay, and then Regal Neal happens, and now everybody's connected. Everybody except Hawaii. Um, they're on the beach. Um, okay, so does this matter? Well, this is just a chart, a chart showing the timing of the traditional uh, Krosner and Strahan deregulation measure versus ours. And on average, our deregulation events happen about three years later than theirs. Okay, so significant uh, difference in timing. Okay, this is just showing that there's variation in net states in, which is our competition measure, uh, both sort of uh, over time and in the cross section. Um, the other nice property about net states in is that by construction, it's always zero on average at a given point in time because, you know, a, 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 a sort of investment opportunity for one state is a competition shock for the other state. So everything always cancels out in aggregate. And this is just showing that, you know, that we do actually have variation. Finally, uh, this isn't driven by one or two states. There's lots of states that are, that are affected by these, uh, by, by net states. In, or there's a lot of states that have these sort of one-way streets at some point in time. And so our, our, uh, our variation is coming from a lot of different states. Okay, so what do we find? Well, first, almost just as a sort of a smell test, right, we'd hope that this measure that we're saying is a good measure of competition is actually correlated with changes in competition. And indeed, what you see is that when net states in is high, that leads to a decrease in the Herfindahl index or an increase in the competition in local banking markets in those states. So it does seem like our measure is uh, correlated with uh, a measure of concentration. I'm not gonna say that Herfindahl indices are a measure of competition, but they're a measure of concentration. Okay, now let's get to the main result, NIM. So again, the, the, the dominant paradigm out there is that after deregulation, NIM went up. Well, once we actually can tease out these competition shocks more cleanly, we see that NIM actually goes down after uh, deregulation. And the magnitude is not huge, but it's enough to get people's attention. Right? So NIM goes down. Um, where, why does NIM go down? Well, banks have to start offering higher interest rates on deposits. We don't actually find much action uh, on loan rates, but we do find a lot of action on deposit rates. So previously I was able to offer my customers a very low deposit rate. Now I have to offer a higher deposit rate when there's more competition. Okay. So in the cross section, sort of who gets, who's more or less affected by deregulation? Well, if you're a big bank, or if you're a bank that already had a pretty good economic mode around you, you're less affected. So the banks that are actually the most affected uh, negatively by deregulation, we find are small banks that are located and concentrated, I'm sorry, in the competitive markets, which should sort of make sense. Okay, if NIM goes down, you know, unless something else changes, profitability is going to go down. Sure enough, ROE and ROA go, go down. Okay, so NIM goes down, profitability goes down. How do banks respond? Well, we look at three different uh, sort of response angles. First, banks start merging with each other at a higher rate. This is sort of mechanical. I'm not really going to focus too much on that, but, but it is still an effect. The other two are more interesting, though. So I'm going to show you a picture in just a minute. Risk-taking goes up pretty significantly, which is, again, the opposite of what the existing literature generally finds. And we find evidence that banks change their business models. They start um, sort of reducing the fraction of loans to assets. So sort of portfolio lending goes down. There's more turnover in loan portfolios. Uh, and there's, there's some evidence, although it's not that as strong, that um, non-interest income goes up as a fraction of total income. Okay. So mergers, you know, so, so like I said, uh, the propensity to merge goes up um, as competition increases. I actually want to point your attention to the failure results. So we find no effects on bank failures. And this is a, in, instructive because it helps to isolate Keeley as the motivation, as the right sort of motivation for this paper. Why? Well, in Keeley's narrative, Banks are not taking enough risk before deregulation, and so after deregulation, they're going to take sort of the competitive level of risk. You might think that, well, maybe there's excessive risk taking after deregulation. No, there's, it appears that actually Keeley was right. Banks weren't taking as much risk as they probably should have before deregulation. Okay? No matter how you measure risk taking, standard deviation of ROE, standard deviation of ROA, loan loss revisions, charge offs, risk taking goes up. Uh, like I said, you see that um, loans to total assets, so portfolio lending, essentially goes down, um, and uh, banks turn over their loans uh, more frequently. This is suggestive of a shift to an originate-to-distribute model, 
Uh, although, you know, I'm not going to push that very hard. I mean, it's sort of interesting because the securitization market was still pretty nascent during this time period, but yet you're already, you are seeing banks sort of shift to more fee, pro, you know, sort of fee income, et cetera, um, during this time. All right, so just to wrap up, uh, the thing that we're doing here is essentially saying, well, the way that we measure the intensity of deregulation um, can be improved. And so we're sort of standing on the shoulders of all of these giants and then sort of kicking them a little bit and saying, you know, well, you could have done the, this a little bit better. And when we do that, what we find is that uh, in complete contrast to the existing literature, after deregulation, the competition-induced effects of deregulation lead to uh, lower NIM, lower profitability, higher risk-taking, and a significant change in banks' balance sheets. Thank you.